and today we're going to talk about a different kind of calorimetry called bomb calorimetry. Now bomb calorimetry is otherwise known as constant volume calorimetry and you're going to see why in just a moment. Now a bomb calorimeter is a specific kind of calorimeter that we're going to use primarily to study combustion reactions. So just as a quick review, a combustion reaction is a reaction that occurs when a hydrocarbon, which contains carbon, hydrogen, and sometimes other things as well, reacts with oxygen gas to form typical combustion products, which you guys know as carbon dioxide gas and water vapor. Now the other thing you also know about a combustion reaction is that it's an exothermic reaction. It gives off heat. So if you think out, for example, burning gasoline, that's a hydrocarbon. When we burn gasoline, we know that it generates heat. Okay, so all combustion reactions are exothermic reactions. Now, back to the reason why we call this constant volume calorimetry and why we want to keep the volume constant. Now, because of the nature of the products that we make here, we're making gaseous carbon dioxide, gaseous water, and a lot of heat, it seems to me we're going to have a work term that we have to think about. So in other words, if I um, talk about the internal energy or change in internal energy of the reaction here, that's going to be the sum of the heat associated with the reaction and the work either done by the reaction or on the reaction. Okay? And keep in mind, we also remember that um, the work term can be expressed as minus P times delta V, where delta V is a change in volume. It's known as P delta V work, which we've talked about before. So if I have a bunch of hot gases expanding, that's a situation where this reaction is going to be doing work on its surroundings. So I've got that work term that I have to include here. Now normally when we do calorimetry, we'd like to make that work term equal to zero. So when we do calorimetry, we're talking about the transfer of heat associated with a reaction, but not necessarily the work being done by that reaction or on that reaction. So what we'd really like to be able to do is to eliminate the work term. If I can eliminate the work term, then the total change in internal energy has to be due to a change in heat associated with that reaction. So here's the trick. We're going to engineer the reaction in such a way that the delta V term is going to be equal to zero. So if delta V is equal to zero, then the P times delta V term also goes to zero, and as a result, we lose the work term. So that means the internal energy associated with the reaction is just equal to the change in heat associated with the reaction. In other words, the amount of heat that the reaction generates or takes in. Now in the case of an exothermic reactor like a combustion, this is going to be heat given off by the reaction to its surroundings. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to run the reaction in a closed container called a bomb. Now, a bomb assembly looks like this. So essentially, the bomb itself is an enclosed stainless steel container. All right, so what I'm doing is I'm setting the interior volume of this thing to a fixed value. All right. So then what's going to happen is I'm going to put a little plug of the hydrocarbon in here and I'm going to run some leads down through it. All right. Now the reason all the leads are there is so that I can essentially apply a spark to this thing so I can set the reaction off with that spark. So we need the leads in there to ignite the reaction. The other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to backfill this thing with a high pressure of oxygen gas to ensure that the oxygen is going to be the excess reactant that makes the hydrocarbon um, plug down there, the limiting react. Then what I'm going to do is apply a spark through the leads here. That's going to initiate the reaction. So we're going to have essentially a miniature explosion happening inside the bomb. Now the deal is, because the interior volume of the bomb is fixed, then the gases cannot expand. So what that means is that I have a delta V equal to zero. So that's why we call this constant volume calorimetry. And remember, if the delta V is equal to zero, the work term goes away. And essentially, 100% of the energy associated with the reaction is going to be heat. Okay? And that's what we're interested in when we do a calorimetry experiment. Now, the bomb assembly itself is just one part of the whole calorimeter assembly. So if we look at the whole calorimeter assembly, we're going to have something that looks like this. As a matter of fact, I think I have it written down here. Um, if you want to take a look at an actual um, calorimeter assembly, sorry, it's over here. 
You can take a look at uh, page 248 in your text, and that'll show you a true bomb calorimetry assembly there. Okay, so feel free to refer to that page. You'll get better art than I can give you here. Now, here's what the whole calorimetry assembly looks like. I essentially have a calorimeter housing, which is basically just a big old chunk of plastic here that's all about, just a big tub, if you will, and it's going to have a top on top of it. So there's going to be, of course, an insulated container inside of that, like a big thermos, which we, of course, have to have if we're dealing with calorimetry. And inside of that thermos, if you will, what I'm going to have is the bomb assembly. I'm going to fill it up with water, so I'm going to have water in there. I'm going to have a stirrer in there, which is a little propeller that turns slowly, so that when any heat emanating from the reaction uh, gets transferred to the water, that heat is distributed evenly throughout the water. And then finally, I'm going to have a thermometer in there so I can actually calculate or monitor a change in temperature associated with this reaction. All right, so let's think about this. I've got a combustion reaction happening inside of the bomb. A whole bunch of heat's getting generated. So the question is, where does that heat go? So the reaction, of course, is my system. Everything else that you see is my surroundings. So we know that in the case of an exothermic reaction, heat's being given off by the reaction, it's being absorbed by the surroundings. So what's actually absorbing the heat? Well, first of all, the bomb assembly is going to absorb some heat, okay? What else is going to absorb heat? Well, the bomb's going to heat up, and some of that heat from the bomb is going to be transferred to the water, so the water's going to absorb some of that heat. The stirrer's going to absorb some of that heat. The thermometer's going to absorb some of that heat. And even the calorimeter body itself is going to absorb some of that heat. So when we go around to try to determine, for example, um, a heat capacity or a standard, um, or I should say, um, the C part in um, there, what do you call that, specific heat for the calorimeter, that's a little bit hard to do because we have a whole bunch of things actually absorbing the heat, not just water like we did in the case of the calf and cup calorimeter. So we're going to come back and take a look at how we can actually determine what that actual specific heat, if you will, associated with the calorimeter looks like. So coming back, folks, to the normal coffee cup calorimeter, we could use this equation that we introduced in the last video where it says that Q, which is the heat, is equal to the um, specific heat of the material times the mass of the material times the um, change in temperature that that material um, experiences. And we saw, for example, how we could, using a coffee cup calorimeter, determine the C value knowing the M, the delta T, and the Q. Now here's the issue. For us to be able to determine a heat of reaction for an unknown reaction, I have to know C and M for each part of my calorimeter, as I mentioned before, because each one of those parts is going to absorb some of the heat, okay? Now, knowing C and M for each one of those parts in the calorimetry assembly is kind of a hard thing to do. So what we're going to do is we're going to eliminate that issue by calibrating the calorimeter by determining in a separate experiment what we call its heat capacity. Now, the heat capacity here is a big C with a little CAL under it. It's sometimes also called the calorimeter constant. So basically, what we want to know is how much um, heat that calorimeter can absorb. And that's going to be a function of a lot of things. Depends upon the parts of the calorimeter, how much water you got in the calorimeter, and all that good stuff. So essentially, what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce this new constant which for the whole calorimeter is a combination of specific heat and mass. All right, so if I do that, I get a new equation over here that I can use when I'm doing specifically bomb calorimetry. So what's going to happen here is the reaction is going to give off heat because it's exothermic. That heat is going to be absorbed by the calorimeter assembly and everything in it. And that's all going to equal to the heat capacity of the calorimeter times the delta T that I'm going to measure on the thermometer. Okay, so that's going to be the delta T for the calorimeter assembly as well. So what I can do is I can solve for C cal. And if I do that, C cal is equal to the heat that's actually absorbed by the calorimeter assembly divided by the delta T. Now what I can do is I can run a known 
um, combustion reaction with a known amount of hydrocarbon in there. Okay, so for example, if I know from a separate experiment the um, kilojoules per mole or heat of combustion of that standard that I use in the calorimeter, and I know how many moles of the standard I use, okay, I can get back to the kilojoules of heat. Okay, if I know the kilojoules of heat, okay, I can measure the delta T for my calorimeter associated with that amount of heat that's going to be generated, and I can calculate a calorimeter constant or a heat capacity for my calorimeter. Once I've got that, I can then use that information to then determine the heat of reaction for some unknown hydrocarbon that I'm going to burn then in the subsequent step in the very same calorimeter. So we're going to take a real quick look at um, an example of calibrating a calorimeter here. So here we have a simple example of how we can actually calculate the heat capacity of a calorimeter from heat data. So this is number nine in your handout. So we have a sample of a hydrocarbon that's going to give off 5,228 calories of heat when it's burned in a bomb calorimeter. Okay, so that's going to be a known amount of heat. All right. Now, it tells me that during this process, the temperature of the calorimeter increases by 4.29 degrees Celsius. So I want to calculate the uh, calorimeter constant or heat capacity of the calorimeter in kilojoules per degree Celsius. All right, so we know the reaction is exothermic. So we know that the reaction is giving off the heat, and we know that the calorimeter assembly is going to absorb the heat. So I know that Q absorbed by the calorimeter is equal to the heat capacity of the calorimeter times the change in temperature that I'm going to note. I can solve the equation for C cal. I get the heat on top. I need this in terms of kilojoules divided by the delta T or temperature change in terms of degrees Celsius. So again, just quickly reviewing, I know the reaction is giving off the heat, so the reaction is decreasing its internal energy, it's transferring the heat to the calorimeter, so the calorimeter is increasing its internal energy, so that's a positive value now. And here's the 5,228 calories of heat that were emanated from the reaction absorbed by the calorimeter. I want to convert that to kilojoules, so I've got to make a conversion from calories to joules, which we know how to do. And then finally, we want to take kilo, rather joules to kilojoules, which we also know how to do. And when we run this calculation, we get 21.87 kilojoules of heat, again, absorbed by the calorimeter. All right? I can then uh, plug this back into my equation here for um, C cal. So here's the heat, 21.87 kilojoules, divided by the 4.29 degrees Celsius. That's the temperature change that corresponded to the absorption of that heat. And I get 5.10 kilojoules of heat per degree Celsius. So that then is the heat capacity for that particular calorimetry um, experiment as I have set it up. So again, it depends upon the calorimeter, how much water I've got in the calorimeter, the um, amount or mass of the hydrocarbon that I'm burning in the calorimeter to give me the 5,228 calories of heat, and so forth and so on. So once we have this value, I can then use this for exactly the same calorimeter assembly with the same amount of water in it to determine an unknown heat of reaction for an unknown hydrocarbon. And that's where we're going to pick it up in class next time, folks. So see you then.